But today's topic is if you could see what we have seen, an accident, aviation accident investigator's perspective, uh, based on the numbers that we're seeing, we believe that this will be one of our highest rated webinars yet. So we appreciate uh, that you've joined us. Today, uh, our speakers will include Jim Viola, our president and CEO of HAI, Clint Johnson, who is the NTSB chief for the Alaska Aviation Region in Anchorage, Alaska. He's also an advisor to the HAI Safety Working Group. We have Matthew Rigsby from the Air Safety Investigator for the FAA Office of Accident Investigation and Prevention. He is also an advisor to the HAI Safety Working Group. We have Chris Lowenstein, Senior Manager, uh, Fleet uh, Safety for Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company. And he is on the steering committee of the US Helicopter Safety Team. Uh, just had a great uh, all hands webinar with the UA USHST yesterday. And we have Chris Hill today, who is our Director of Safety for HAI. He's the staff liaison to the HAI Safety Working Group and is also on the steering committee of the US, the USHST. <laughs> We uh, do invite you to ask questions during the course of the uh, webinar. Uh, we will hold all questions until the end. There is a module on the control panel on the side of your screen. Please use that to write in your questions. And again, we will address them at the end of the webinar. Please understand that we cannot accept questions about any open accident investigations uh, anywhere in the world. That's just uh, not something that we're going to address at all. And then there will be a video link that will follow, usually within 24 hours, uh, along with a poll question or a survey uh, that we would appreciate your assistance with. And now I'd like to turn this over to Jim Viola, who uh, has a few opening remarks. All right, uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever we are around the world. I know we had uh, 22 countries that have uh, signed up uh, as part of the webinar, so I wanna thank you. And I also want to thank, uh, first of all, the NTSB uh, for letting us uh, get some of your resources here, as well as the FAA and uh, Sikorsky as well. The three men on the webinar today are experts in the helicopter accident investigations. And uh, we have, uh, I think the numbers are up around 400 that signed up for today's webinar. So um, I know that's of interest to everybody. The question was, if you could see what they see or have seen, how would that change your behavior if you're a mechanic and or a pilot? There's a lot to think about in that question. And a lot of it is that as you get into the accidents and some of the good work that's done by the US helicopter safety team, as well as the European helicopter safety team. And you heard the HAI a working safety working group. So there's many safety organizations that are all trying to answer that same question of how do we make sure that the lessons learned from the accidents as well as training can be passed on to to make sure that we have zero fatalities is what everyone has agreed on now in industry is that we can actually get there for zero fatalities. And so the question is in the case is, are we making the same mistakes? You know, we, uh, HAI, we push out a daily news aggregator called the, da the Rotor Daily. If you're not getting that, you can certainly go to our webpage and sign up. And really most of the widely read stories are about accidents. And so we kind of question the ability that, that you know, are we learning from those stories? Are we learning from others' uh, misfortunes? And are we actually getting safer? Uh, and so hopefully today, as we go through some of the briefings here, you'll ask yourself those questions. You know, are we making the same mistakes out there and how do we prevent that? We know we're human and humans do have faults, but we have to put practices and procedures in place to be as safe as possible. And again, the goal for, I think, all the safety organizations are zero fatalities and we know we can get there. So the safe and sound aeronautical decision-making is certainly part of that. Well-trained and well-equipped equipped is number two there. And so the fact, and the fact that you are here today on this webinar, you know, you're probably the, the people that are doing all you can to be as safe as possible out there and trying to prevent that next action, not only for you, but for those that you know in industry. And if you get what, uh, you know, you get some good stuff from the, today's webinar, please pass the link along to uh, others that you work with daily. So I wish it was as simple as saying, let's just stop making the same mistakes and let's just go out there and zero accidents, zero fatalities, uh, because we know it is possible. And I know when, when I was working a lot closer with the US helicopter safety team, 
and we're tracking the days between accidents, there was months that we've gone with no accident. So if you can do that, if you can do it once, you can do it continually. So let's keep working towards that. And uh, and I know, like I said, the three people here, we're talking about Clint, Matt, and Chris, and I've known them all for over 10 years and the great work that they do on putting the puzzle back together of, of how the accident happened. And again, lessons learned so that we can incorporate them in training or whatever we have to do to, to continue to get better. So with that, I'd like to now introduce Clint Johnson. And as I said earlier, he's the chief of the NTSB Alaska Aviation Regional Office in Anchorage. Welcome, Clint. All over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Jim. And uh, it's great to be here. Uh, welcome to sunny Alaska. Unfortunately, it's not real sunny right now. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm really glad to be here. Full disclosure, this is my first webinar I've uh, ever been a part of. So all I can say is what could possibly go wrong? So, uh, but anyway, thanks again, Jim. I, I appreciate the, the invite and uh, looking forward to it. So as Jim mentioned, my name is Clint Johnson. I'm the chief of the Alaska Regional Office of the NTSB based here in Anchorage. And obviously we see a number of helicopter accidents, unfortunately here in Alaska, but uh, also nationwide. But before we get started, try to advance the slide here. There it is. Let's do just a real quick uh, overview of what the NTSB does just to provide a bit of a, a level set here. So the NTSB is an independent federal agency charged with investigating transportation accidents. Granted, we're going to be talking about aviation today, and we're only an aviation office here. Uh, but the important thing is, and if there's one takeaway that we get that you're able to get, uh, glean today, is we're we're independent. Again, need to stress we have that independency. We're not part of the FAA, not part of DOT or any other federal agency. And typically what we do is we determine probable cause of any civil aviation accident. And then what we also do is issue recommendations to keep that accident from happening again, if it's warranted. We obviously don't uh, uh, issue uh, recommendations on every single accident investigation we do, uh, but we look for those nuggets to keep that accident from happening again. So just a little bit about myself here and uh, uh, just, just to kind of give you a little bit of a level set of, of my perspective and some of my views. I was actually, uh, my family was in the helicopter business, came up to Alaska in the 60s, mid 60s, and uh, operated for another 29 years here. We sold that business to uh, Era Helicopters back in 1995. And then soon after that, I got on to, uh, with the NTSB. I flew for them, was also in, in the management side. So my perspective is probably a little bit different than Chris's and also Matt's but we all bring good uh, past experience uh, to this job that we're doing now, which is accident investigation. Been with the board for 24 years now. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, it's amazing. I used to be one of the young kids, not the case anymore. And during that career with the NTSB, I have actually investigated over 800 accidents. Not every single one has been a fatal accident. Uh, that's total number of accidents that I've done during that time. So I, I don't do that to, 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 to boast or anything, but again, to give you a little bit more perspective and a little more insight of some of my, of my uh, uh, past experience here. When, when Chris and Jim had first asked me to, to do this, what they wanted is basically some, some takeaways from 24 years being with the, with the NTSB. And probably the overriding one, without a doubt, is nobody is immune. Unfortunately, I've done, fatal accidents on 150 hour pilots and 15,000 hour pilots. Again, nobody is immune, you drop your guard at one point in time, all those stars align and we have a horrible accident. Second thing is, is that it always seems like it, you, when you're talking to, to other folks that have been, been involved in accidents, they always think that it's gonna happen to somebody else. Well, I'm, I'm here to say, unfortunately, that's not the case. It can happen and it does happen. And then, also adhering to those personal uh, limitations and also the organizational limitations. Those organizational limitations are there for a reason. They're written in blood, I hate to say it, but there's a reason why those limitations are there and it's, uh, it's good practice to, to abide by those, those limitations. Mm -hmm. So basically, whenever we do press conferences, you always hear us revert back to the, to the basics, man, machine, environment. And that, that first one should be person, but it doesn't fit in our little, uh, little pyramid there. But man is more of the, the human portion of it, machine being the mechanical, did something break? 
an environment is the uh, usually the weather, but other factors in the environment play into it. But 90% of the time, what we're addressing there is weather weather problems. So for our short amount of time today, we're going to look at just at the man portion, the human portion, the 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 the, the human interface into an accident. One thing we need to do going forward is weather does not cause accidents. You will never see one of our probable causes saying that the weather caused the accident. It's the actions of the pilot or the flight crew into those weather conditions could be a factor, but you'll never see where it is uh, an actual cause as far as weather goes. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about CFIT accidents. Unfortunately, we've seen a rise in CFIT accidents, CFIT being controlled flight into train, very, very, uh, you know, basic, taking a perfectly good helicopter, flying it into rising terrain, usually in, in low visibility or reduced visibility, I should say. The one cool thing about hanging out with the NTSB is I get a chance to, to rub elbows and work with some folks that are a lot smarter than I am. I'm, I'm here to, to say, uh, I have to pinch myself every once in a while, but Evan Byrne, Dr. Evan Byrne, is the chief of our human factors division in Washington, D.C. Lots of experience, a GA pilot himself, and uh, has a tremendous of background as far as human factors and uh, flight crew uh, errors that have been made. So about two or three years ago, I went to Evan and I asked him, I says, give me six top contenders as far as human error or, or CFIT accidents those top six areas that you normally see. And it took him a couple of days to get back to me, but here's kind of what we came up with. The first one's kind of a duh for the most part, marginal VFR, uh, dark night conditions, basically reduced visibility. It, 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 everybody knows that that's the case, but it has to be number one, no ifs, no ands, no buts. Second one is to the uh, reluctance to abandon a plan. You're trying to get through a mountain pass, and I'm talking about flying up here in Alaska, trying to get from one community to another. You don't ha you have that plan. You, you, you're hell bent on getting to the, to, the, uh, to the location or to your destination, and there's, there's no backup plan. That pretty much goes hand in hand with this one, no backup plan, no alternate. Um, if you can't get from one, one through one area, where are you going to go? Where's your alternate? Pressure to succeed. Um, anybody that has done this for a job, I was there myself, you always want to do, do the best job for the customer or for the client. It could be self-induced pressure. It could be uh, external pressure from the operator. It could be some uh, the patient in the back that you're trying to get, get to, uh, to a, a medical facility. That pressure drives us to, uh, to make, make errors. Past accomplishment, this is a big one. Um, You've done it before. You, you, your uh, threshold, your, your personal minimums are lowered. You, you get accustomed to doing this, this type of uh, behavior, and that just cements it even further. And last but not least, unfamiliar with the flight route. And if you've ever been on a flight before, as far as going to a, a location that you've never been there before, things are, are, are not quite as routine and uh, can become a problem. So just in review, uh, lessons learned here. Here's the six that uh, Evan came up with, and uh, it's it's great uh, great information for us to to remember. So at our uh, trying to advance the slide here. So uh, at our uh, NTSB Academy, which is in uh, Ashburn, Virginia, there's an inscription outside as you walk through the door. And basically what's, what is engraved in that inscription is from tragedy we draw a, a monk to improve the safety of us all. And that's basically what the NTSB does. Long story short, we, we investigate accidents, we learn what happened, and then try and get that information out to keep it from happening again. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt Rigsby, somebody that I've worked with for many, many years uh, on the FAA side, and uh, NTSB and FAA work together all the time. Matt's a great guy, great American, and uh, take it away, Matt. Thanks, Clint. Let's get mine up here.
Matt, you should just have to click the screen once and then now you can advance. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and, and uh, thank you for joining us. And I, I will say um, welcome to, to sunny Texas. It is it is a, a beautiful sunny day here in Texas. And uh, like Clint said, uh, I've been in this. I, I worked back from a manufacturer standpoint, and a uh, then I came to the FAA 20 uh, 22 years ago now. So um, the FAA's role in accident investigation is similar to the NTSB. Uh, we are part of the Department of Transportation and we have the responsibility to ensure uh, safety and efficiency within the national airspace system. Uh, by statute, the FAA is a party to all uh, accident investigations and uh, but we do not determine the probable cause. Um, that's the NTSB's responsibility, and we are there to help them hopefully get to the, the probable cause as well. Um, the FAA has nine areas of responsibility that were involved. Uh, they include things like FAA facilities, uh, airworthiness of the aircraft, um, FAR adequacy or inadequacies, uh, airman certification, medical, airport certification, hazmat, and the medical qualifications. And then ultimately, um, where a lot of people kind of get confused with this is uh, FAR violations. And uh, we, we do get in FAR violations. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, the FA, most GA accidents are deemed uh, what they call limited by the NTSB, which oftentimes means that they will not travel uh, to those accidents. Uh, last statistics we have about 12% of the GA accidents, um, they still investigate 100% of them, and, but the FAA is delegated to investigate the rest of those limited accidents. Um, the FAA investigates all accidents as well, as well as some incidents, and the FAA travels to about 90% of all of the accidents out there. Uh, during this difficult time of COVID and everything that's going on, I would like to give a shout out to all of our, uh, there's about 3,600 uh, FISDO inspectors out there and over 100 FISDO offices out there, but they are still launching on fatal accidents, uh, about 90, almost 99% of the accidents out there. I can only think of a couple of fatal accidents since COVID started that they have not responded to. So they're really doing a outstanding job uh, launching all those accidents and then providing that information to the NTSB from the scene and acting on their behalf uh, on scene. Uh, we investigate also about 3000 incidents annually. And those can be anything from, from drone issues to commercial space events. Um, as a party, of course, every FAA, like any other party member, the FAA shares what they learn with the NTSB. And then uh, we will uh, go in and look at those nine responsibilities and see uh, what we need to do to improve safety. Um, the FAA's accident investigation policy um, is this, it's 8020-11D. If you all Google that, that's kind of our Bible that tells us how we go about this and do accident investigation. Um, one of the things that Chris asked me to identify when he talked to me about this is he seems to get a lot of questions on the FAA's role in accident investigation and an FAA inspector being there and doing enforcement work uh, while he's doing an accident investigation. And while that is, you know, determining an unsafe condition is an area of responsibility. Uh, the FAA will conduct uh, oftentimes a separate investigation that's not associated with the safety investigation for an enforce enforcement case if needed. Um, FAA participating in the NTSB <coughs> safety investigation should not be a part of that in, uh, enforcement action. So if the investigator that launches on the accident to <coughs> uh, for the safety end of it, and looks at the accident, the information that he's gleaned and 
everything he, he develops, uh, uh, say an office manager would, would provide a, another investigator to start looking at it from a enforcement, if needed, uh, case to look at. So we do try to conduct separate investigations out there. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing that, uh, as I think everybody's mentioned, is that those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, and as Jim said, we're really not inventing any new accidents that, that occur out there. Um, I actually got this from Clint's family, the investigative investigators that we are. That's what it takes to kind of be an accident investigator is you have to have an inquisitive spirit or you want to get to the bottom. If you like putting jigsaw puzzles together and things like that, then you're more likely you will like the, the process and, and the, the theory behind accident investigation. Matt, we've had a problem with your uh, slide advancement, so let me know when you're ready to move forward, please. Okay. I'm on page seven. Showing okay. accident synopsis. Yes, sir. Okay. The other thing that um, Chris asked me to do is kind of pick an accident that stood out in my mind. And this was an, an, an air medical accident several years ago that I participated on. And it was an inner facility transport. Uh, for those that don't know, that's going from one hospital to another hospital. It wasn't going from a scene. And on the way from the, um, the dispatch hospital to the other hospital, uh, the pilot checked whether did everything in accordance with, he, with his procedures and policies. Um, it was at night. Um, this was not, they did not have night vision goggles on this flight. But as he was approaching the receiving hospital, um, he had to d descend in order to maintain some cloud clearance. Um, and that w w was not forecasted in the weather that he, he looked at. So he landed the, at the hospital, delivered the patient, the crew went in, uh, delivered the patient. And he went down and actually looked at weather again. And the weather had changed some since he initially looked at it and um so he gets back and goes back to the the, the helipad on the roof uh, the crew comes out and basically the pilot informs him as in accordance with their risk management procedures you know the three to say go one to say no and says look you know as we're coming in i noticed that the weather was or the weather had changed a little bit and the cloud deck was lower than we expected and he says, what do you all think about going, returning to the base? Um, and, or, you know, what, what, what would you prefer we do? Um, they all agreed that they would return to the base. Uh, as they're talking though, they said on the roof of Helibad, they said, but just in case, let's go over our inadvertent IMC procedures. And just so that we're ready in the event that we would go inadvertent IMC or, or as, uh, some of the agencies are calling it U UA UIMC, unintended flight into meteorological conditions. And <clears throat> so they departed. Um, the helicopter took off in the southbound at a cruise altitude of 1,500 feet, uh, roughly about uh, 800 feet above the ground, which their normal uh, flight profile was about 1,000 feet above the ground. Um, as they were going through there, and they were actually going through their inadvertent IMC procedures, which the, for that time, they were basically was to stabilize the aircraft, climb the aircraft to 3,500 feet, and then contact air traffic control. Um, they got about approximately halfway to their base. And uh, when the, one of the crew members in the back said, we're entering a cloud, uh, he recalls the pilot saying, well, that's not good. And the crew member responded, climbed to 3,500 feet. And then the crew member said, I see lights to the left. And the pilot responded, tell me more about those lights. I'm turning left. And as he was turning left, um, the crew member basically saw the strobe lights uh, illuminate the trees. Uh, the other uh, crew member recalls hearing the second crew member uh, basically yell, pull up, pull up, climb, climb, climb and then just recalls hearing the sound of the accident happening. Um, 
This was is a graphical depiction of the cloud cover at that time um, at the accident location. And this is the subsequent result. Uh, unfortunately, the pilot did sustain fatal injuries in this accident, uh, but the crew members uh, survived and were there to tell us the story. Um, as we're discussing, you know, with with the crew members and and post interviews, you know, uh, you know, we asked questions like, you know. It, would the company have allowed you to to go to a different location? They they actually had an alternate base, very close to the hospital that they could have landed and spent the night. Um, they said they 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 they're like Clint used some of his. They were weren't willing to accept the situation they were in, and they all wanted to get back to the base. It was a primary reason why they chose to continue the flight. Uh, the pilot himself. Uh, like Clint said, it's everything from, from low time guys to, to high time guys. Uh, this gentleman was at a relatively moderate time, um, 2,384.7 hours. Uh, he was also military time and he was a Chinook driver. So he had experience, he had about 200 hours of actual instrument time that uh, he was using. Um, the, the, one of the, the, the sad parts and the repeating things that I see in these accidents is um, this pilot had just completed actual IMC, inadvertent IMC training two weeks before this accident. Uh, the training he received was basically to stabilize the aircraft, wings level, climb, call ATC, declare an emergency, and then ask for vectors to VFR or if necessary, vectors to, to shoot a basic uh, instrument landing if, if VFR conditions were not available. Uh, the aircraft he was in was not a, a IFR certified aircraft. It was a VFR only aircraft and the company was a VFR only aircraft. So why did the pilot not do as he was trained? His first response, rather than even though he, his crew member, you know, and they supposedly had just gone over their inadvertent IMC procedures was rather than climb, he actually said, tell me about the lights. I'm turning towards the lights. Uh, I wish this, would could say this was an isolated case. Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, this these statistics are from the the uh, U.S. Helicopter Safety Team, the Joint Industry FAA um, HAI participant groups um, the that do the analysis. Uh, the UIMC category uh, jumped out of the chart in 2019. It's the number one killer for for helicopter accidents today. Um, it was present in eight of 24 or 33% of all U.S. fatal helicopter accidents for 2019. Uh, that percentage uh, for 20, 2009 to 2013 was 17% of all fatal helicopter accidents. And then in two, 2014 to 18, it was 14% of all helicopter accidents. Uh, I think Jim said, mentioned about aeronautical decision making. Uh, train like you fly and fly like you train are some, some takeaways. Uh, this is just, and this is courtesy of uh, the Rotorcraft Standard Staff and Lee Ross Crop and the outstanding work that he does on the US, US helicopter safety team, uh, working with all the data and presenting it. Uh, after seeing Clint's presentation, I, I had to pull up this same uh, slogan, from tragedy, we draw knowledge to improve safety for all of us. Um, every one of these accidents that you see out there today, you know, they, ha they had some takeaways that we could improve aviation safety with. Okay, now uh, that completes my presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Chris Lowenstein uh, from Sikorsky uh, Helicopters. Uh, Chris has been in the industry for as long as I've been in the industry. A great individual, like considering close friend, and as well as a very knowledgeable individual. And uh, take it away, Chris. Thanks, Matt. I uh, really appreciate the intros from from Chris, Jim, and 
Clint and you. Um, it has been a uh, pleasure to work with all, all of you. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, you know, again, if you could see what I have seen, I'm going to cover just one accident and um, some of the takeaways from that accident. A little background on myself. Um, I've been at Sikorsky for, I can't believe I'm going to say this, 34 years, um, with about 25 years of that in directly in accident investigation. Um, so uh, it's it's been a long, uh, interesting journey, and uh, we'll go through through some of these slides if my advancer works. Um, I'm going to cover this uh, accident. Uh, some of you who have attended the NTSB Training Academy or the TSI um, Rotorcraft Investigation Course in Oklahoma City may have seen parts of this. Obviously, it's a very long and detailed investigation. Um, one of the probably one of the more complex helicopter investigations ever conducted. Um, but I'm going to just do a quick, quick uh, overview of it and just one takeaway that that could have prevented it, uh, despite the the complexity and the number of different involved links in the accident chain. Um, and we'll go go through that. Uh, again, the accident occurred in 2008, August of 2008. Uh, during a firefighting um, mission. The aircraft itself was an S61N. It was equipped with STC rotor blades, so a, a different blade than originally manufactured. It had an STC fire extinguishing tank carrying about a thousand gallons of water. It's a conformal tank. You can see it there in the, in the picture. And uh, it was also modified with S61L non-retractable landing gear as opposed to the original S61 and amphibious landing gear, which is a retractable landing gear. The uh, departure point was the top of a saddle in a large um, forest fire. The Shasta National Forest at the time was uh, burning pretty extensively in 2008. There, were, uh, there was a fire cut crew at the top of this saddle and there were about 30 firefighters that needed to be moved from that saddle uh, because they were expecting bad weather later in the day, thunderstorms, they didn't want the, um, the folks to be trapped up there. So they were gonna move them down to a safer location um, in a valley. The accident takeoff was actually the third takeoff from this location. And uh, we'll go through here. And we look at, whoops advances twice every time I hit it. Uh, the departure point, we had the first tree strike, uh, and then we find the wreckage uh, further down the hill. What we're looking at directly in into the hill, um, directly back up the flight path, um, and that location of main wreckage is substantially lower than the takeoff point. The takeoff point, as I said, was kind of at the base of a saddle there. Um, they clipped the first tree and uh, second tree and eventually, eventually ended up um, impacting the ground. You can see some um, remnants of rotor blade here, tail here, the main wreckage, uh, and the nose of the aircraft is here. Here's another view just to kind of give you a better overview of the accident situation. You can still see the fire, uh, smoke from the fire burning in the distance. Um, that was another challenge that we faced uh, going to this site. We had to fly into the site as well um, and had to go through the training to um, respond in case the fire burned over in this direction, which luckily it did not. Um, here's a image of the, the wreckage afterwards. You can see the tail is relatively intact. The center part of the aircraft is substantially burned. And uh, unfortunately, there were nine fatalities in this um, accident and four survivors. Here's an NTSB slide showing the uh, angle of impact as the aircraft came through cutting trees um, and ending up impacting uh, below the, the primary, uh, the last tree that they hit there. It again sparked a, a substantial post-crash fire. You see two different color flames in this picture here. The brighter white flames to the left is the gearbox magnesium burning. It burns extremely intensely. It's very hard to put out. So 
that continued to burn uh, for some period of time. The more orange flame is the typical organic material like fuel um, and the fuel cells themselves um, burning. The most important part of this accident, again, it was an extremely, extremely involved accident uh, investigation involving, uh, it was a NTSB the field major, so a field investigator, uh, Jim Strusaker, ran the investigation. There were um, operations groups, uh, airworthiness groups, meteorology groups, um, and, and just numerous types of uh, investigations taking about two and a half years to really get through the entire investigation. Um, one of the key parts of this investigation was the fact that we had a cockpit voice recorder on the aircraft. Having the cockpit voice recorder on the aircraft, we typically think of cockpit voice recorders as, okay, well, this pilot was saying this, this pilot was saying that, air traffic control was saying something else, you know, in, in the big iron events. In a helicopter, we can get a substantial amount of information from the background noise that the cockpit voice recorder records. We use a separate dedicated mic called the cockpit ambient microphone in many cases to listen to the sounds that are occurring in the cockpit. Um, and in Big Iron, again, a lot of times they will listen for swap, flap switch deployments, landing gear switch deployments, things like that. But in a helicopter, as most of you know, they're really noisy and uh, you're not gonna hear any switch clicks, but you certainly can hear the transmission and you certainly can hear the engines. And by knowing the specific speeds at which certain components in the engines and gearbox are rotating, we can actually plot NR, the rotational speed of the rotor, and NGs, the rotational speed of the power producing uh, parts of the engines. And in this view, we see they're sitting at the ground, loading folks onto the helicopter. They advance the throttles and rotor speeds up a little bit more than they would normally uh, you know, up to above normal speed, and they expect it as they pull pitch and um, apply collective that they're going to level off at about 103% here. This is the uh, rotor speed is on the blue. And yet that doesn't happen. We also see the NG, engine speeds, uh, low engine, engine speeds as they bring the throttles forward, the engines come up, they start matching each other. Here it's very important, they exceed the red line, dual engine operating red line and continue to go up and then level off at what is known as topping power. That topping power indicates that those engines are producing as much power as they can for the given conditions. So we never want to operate at topping power intentionally. So in their pre-flight planning, they make calculations for how much weight can we carry at this temperature, this altitude, how much power do we need? How much power do we have? And they do all of that pre-flight planning. And obviously here, something went really, really wrong because they're at topping power. We see the power continuing or the rotor speed continuing to droop below 103% where they expected it to level off, continues to droop. There's a comment on the CVR about drooping. We have a little bit of recovery here and that's as the pilot attempts to lower the collective just a bit to regain some of that rotor speed, but then sees the trees coming up, pulls it again, and we lose the, the CVR uh, just before impact. So what, what we're seeing here, what could they have done differently? Now, I can't go into the in entire investigation because it takes about two hours to do so, but there were numerous issues um, with the pre-flight planning for as much as how much power available they had, some of the charts were wrong, how much power was required for the blades, some of that data was wrong, the weight and balance of the aircraft, some of that data was wrong. And when you study this accident, you, you realize how many different things were, were wrong. But the takeaway and, and what I really wanted to bring to this group is that this accident could have prevented, been prevented not once, not twice, but three times. As I mentioned earlier, this was the third takeoff from this location. On the first takeoff, 
we look, went back and looked at the CVR and they went to topping power on the first takeoff for a substantial amount of time, not quite this long, but a substantial amount of time. We went back and looked at the second takeoff. On the second takeoff, they just hit topping power because they had burned so much fuel that they were substantially lighter than the first takeoff. But they did hit topping power, which is again, not expected on a routine takeoff. And then on the third takeoff, we see that they're at topping power uh, literally until they hit the trees. There were several reasons why they were at topping power. I mentioned the power available issues, the power required issues, and the weight and balance issues. But again, I say three times this accident could have been prevented with a simple, simple, simple procedure that everyone who's a helicopter pilot can do. And it's a hover power check. If on that first takeoff, they had done a hover power check, they would have said, wow, for some reason, we don't know yet why, but for some reason, we're requiring substantially more power than we've predicted based on our pre-flight planning. And they could have offloaded some equipment, offloaded some personnel to get to a acceptable hover power margin, and these flights would have continued without, without event. And I say it could have been prevented three times because they did not do a hover power check or change their behavior based on a hover power check on e any one of those three takeoffs where simply putting the aircraft in a hover, assessing the situation, and then making their commit to depart would have been uh, the, the proper way to do it and would have prevented this accident and prevented those, those nine fatalities and, and four serious injuries. So these are the NTSB's conclusions. Uh, all three takeoffs from that H44 spot, they went to topping. Again, that's indicating marginal performance. You're right at the edge. The indications to the flight crew were available. They exceeded that 100% NG redline limit. And what's interesting is there was a Forest Service check airman on board the aircraft as well. So there are basically three pilots in this aircraft and no one commented on the CVR that they had exceeded those, those redline limits. The NTSB's conclusion was that this is a indication of normalization of exceedances. Uh, that normalization of exceedances is where, um, as Clint mentioned in his presentation, you become so accustomed to doing something some way that you, you, you get comfortable with it. So logging and water operations have jettisonable loads. If it's, the aircraft is too heavy to fly, you can jettison your log, you can jettison your water. And so you may become more comfortable than you should be operating right near the maximum capability of the aircraft. And then finally, whoops, I think that's, yeah. Finally, the helicopter was simply too heavy to take off successfully from the H-44. Again, as I mentioned, the excess weight was primarily a result of the altered performance charts. There were issues with the performance charts, issues with the empty weight, issues with some of their flight planning on above min minimum specification torque. And again, the marginal performance that was not addressed by the NG redline exceedances. And that marginal performance would have been detected with a very, very, very simple hover power check. So that's the takeaway from, from this. That was uh, what Chris Hill had asked for um, you know, one of those things that where you're on the scene and, you know, looking back at it, what could have been done differently to prevent this accident? And again, we spent two and a half years investigating this accident, extremely complex cause factors, yet it would have, would have been very simple to, to prevent the accident in the first place. So um, with that, I'll go back to Chris Hill and um, any questions? All right. Thanks, Chris. Outstanding presentation. Thank you for that. And uh, I'll go ahead and ask uh, Matt and Clint to go ahead and join us on the panel here and we'll light this candle. All right. Well, first of all, thanks. Thanks so much. Already you offer some really rich, uh, actionable tips and tricks to, to prevent future accidents from the same things you continue to see over and over again. Um, I appreciate that. I, I had a great uh, little comment above and beyond that, but I'll go ahead and quote one of our uh, uh, our, our folks that are listening in today, Robert Kandel. 
And he says, I believe some pilots are able to witness or understand the devastation and loss of life via first or second hand account like you guys. That would force us all to accept and maybe think twice before we take unneeded risk. I think uh, Robert said it no better than anybody else could say. He says, finally, he salutes all of you and, and all the things that you do and uh, lots of things that you simply can't forget. But thanks for passing that on to our, uh, our folks listening in today. We really appreciate that. So uh, a couple of little housekeeping items. Some folks have commented that they've had a hard time reading the slides. They're a little, maybe a little too small. That's, that's a common problem. Some maybe not even see the slides. Um, I just draw your attention uh, to your uh, panel off to the side where you have your file menu options and things of that nature. Right off to that side, you should have one of the tabs that reads handouts. Each of your panelists today has uh, graciously provided a copy of their presentation. Reading it or watching it out of context probably doesn't give you as rich of an experience as you received today, but there is one particular nugget on there that really resonated with you or you wanted to see or read again. By all means, feel free to download those. Those will be available throughout the webinar, and then we will finally have a final recording that Dan will uh, review at the end uh, on all that. So let's let's get started here. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions rolling in from the audience, and I'm looking forward to getting into it. Uh, each of you talked about various aspects, whether it be operational planning, culture, technical performance. Um, one of the key things I think is going to be great for the audience to listen in on is just kind of getting inside your head and understanding what, what you see and observe and feel and you know, what the emotion you experience during the course of your accident investigation career. So we're going to try to focus on those type of questions today. So. Uh, Right off the bat, we've got one of our uh, repeat uh, listeners and former HAI safety director. So I'm still trying to fill his big shoes, but Jay Heffernan, thank you for your kickoff question. You beat everybody to it. Uh, he quotes one member of the panel today. We'll see what one of you figures it out. Is often quoted as saying, the metal never lies. While this is true, people do lie. So what is your most effective technique to overcome this obstacle to investigations? Ring a bell, anybody? Chris? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe that was me. Uh, I, I've worked for work, worked for Jay for, for a number of years and uh, have great respect for his his expertise. But yeah, the metal never lies was was told to me by a, a crusty CW4 on an army investigation um, many, many, many moons ago. And um, it, it's true. And people don't intend to lie in most cases. Uh, some some cases they they do, uh, but many cases they don't. But people who have witnessed an accident generally have never seen an ac accident before. So the brain's processing capability is not really what we would expect. There's a lot of interpolation and extrapolation that occurs when your brain sees something that it's never seen before. So the recall of that event is often distorted both in accuracy and usually even more in time, uh, the sequence of events and the relative proximity of those events can be often very confused. And that's how we use the human response to an accident. We have to correlate it with hard facts like the metal and the CVR and the, the actual recorded data to actually fix those pieces in time, but uh, great question and, and good to hear from you, Jay. All right, great, great response there. Thanks for that, Chris. All right, so um, one of the things we promised in our uh, e-blast going out to everybody, prompting people to join this event was we wanted to help them understand some of the things that frustrate you the most. So um, all of you have, uh, and I've had a similar unenviable experience of reviewing cockpit voice recorders like you just mentioned, Chris. And sometimes you just hear the same tape playing over and over and over again. Uh, I'd ask, uh, maybe I'll just go to you first, Clint, uh, since uh, you're next up on my screen here. Is there any particular thing that you've listened on a tape or experienced out in the field that just drives you crazy with frustration that you just wish we could reverse and share that with the audience today and maybe take that with them? Yeah, I mean, probably one of the toughest parts of our job is listening to a, a fatal cockpit voice recorder. That that leaves a mark. Long story short, it leaves a, definitely a, a mark in your uh, in your daily life. 
coming back home and trying to forget that. So I, all I can say is it, it, it definitely is uh, is is uh, is moving to hear that. I guess you know as far as my frustrations and and maybe it's just my age, hence the the gray hair here, is seeing the same thing happen over and over again. Uh, we can we can preach to the cows come home, but the same things we're not inventing new ways to wreck helicopters, unfortunately. And I know Matt Zuccaro said that, you know, in his years for a long, long time. That's probably my biggest frustration, but I, I'd like to hear from, from Matt and also Chris as well, because we, we sh I think we probably sh all share in this as well. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's Go okay. Ahead, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. <clears throat> I mean, after doing, I think around 250 plus field accidents now, you know, uh, a common thread, uh, I mean, there's multiple threads, but they're, a common thread is that a lot of times the the accident is is preventable. There's either a, uh, like some people refer to it as pink, procedural intentional noncompliance. Uh, they either violate the rules or they violate the, their SOPs. Uh, they don't follow the checklist. That's one thing that it seems like is a, is a recurring theme. Uh, doing something like Chris said, his, the 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 hover check, or just like when I was learning to fly, the my instructor said the first thing I want you to do is just bring the aircraft up to a three foot hover and just sit there a minute. Just go back, do a cross reference, and then depart. So that if something's wrong in that while you're at three feet, it's easy to handle. Just put the aircraft back down and 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 go on, and <clears throat> so not following checklists, not following procedures, that type of thing is uh, is is very frustrating. Uh, one quick other thing is we all have done accidents where we have friends or colleagues involved in the accident. I did one before I had to recuse myself because I because I knew him, but the first thing that he told me is as I pulled up on the accident scene and got out and. I said, Charlie, are you okay? And he said, he said, I'm okay. He said, but Matt, I knew I shouldn't be flying. But he pushed himself. He was going through a divorce. He was sick, wasn't living in his house. Just this, the human factors that play into it. I don't think we all, pilots and individuals, uh, can take that into account for so enough. So, Chris, I'll, I'll pass it on to Chris. Yeah, I, I agree. It's 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 the repeated accident, I think, that is the most frustrating to an investigator. Our our whole purpose for doing this job is to prevent accidents. And once we find the cause of an accident, we want to prevent that type of accident from happening ever again in the future. And unfortunately, that's simply not the case. Repeat accidents do happen. And obviously, that's like we said, more common than any other kind of accident. So those those are the ones that are really frustrating. And um, nobody gets up in the morning and goes flying and says, I'm going to have an accident today. Everybody's doing what they're doing for a reason, for their mission, as Clint said earlier, to keep the client or the customer happy. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we've spent a lot of time focusing on EMS world because uh, HAA because those guys have all kinds of pressure and we've done a lot to take that pressure away from the pilot directly, but we still know that those folks are under tremendous amounts of pressure and we need to do everything that we can to manage that pressure and using SMS and personal checklists and personal minima and um, things like that to really to really reduce those those types of repeat accidents. All right, thanks. I appreciate that. Well, we're getting lots of questions in here asking for details about the actual accident investigation, technical things about the weather, performance. In order to, in, in order to focus our discussions, I'll just remind everybody, feel free to go to the NTSB site, look up these particular accidents, and maybe we can provide the, uh, the, the case number for each one of these docket numbers so they can be easy, easily tracked. People can get lots of rich information and details on that. So I apologize for not getting into those specifics. I will uh, touch on a couple of points here. Richard Gallagher chimed in and said, is there a way to change the double IMC procedure currently taught to non-IFR pilots? And then another comment that came in that was along the lines of, let me get there real quick. Uh, any turn in double IMC usually kills. The 180 needs to be changed. 
you know, he goes on to say a few other things. So that was also Richard. Uh, I'll go to you, Matt, because there's good news out there. The Rotocraft Flying Handbook has been updated. So why don't you go and take a stab at that one and uh, assure some folks that it's not the same as it once was. Right, right. Yeah, that's one of the things that's, uh, that's we, we've recognized as an agency that where the Rotocraft Flying Handbook was was lacking in. And so it has been updated and it's continually being updated. Matter of fact, I believe there's another um, update in progress to go into uh, UIMC even in more detail. Um, the uh, lost your thought there. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's it, it it is a killer. We recognize it, and so we're trying to do what we can to get the word out there. Um, I do know that you know I, I, it seems like, and I don't think it's just helicopter pilots. Pilots in general are reluctant to declare an emergency with air traffic. And it's just, you know, it's it's not that big of a deal to declare an emergency. Um, if the administrator, which is with air traffic or whoever, your your POI or whatever, goes, doesn't request for additional information within a 48 hour time period, you can you can there's there's no action required on your part. The um uh, if if a controller gets you and gets you down safely, more than likely, you know, you may it may be a non-event to you. It, you know, just take it as a lesson learned. You made made it through it and you got back on the ground safely. Um, in the 135 world, uh, we did change the rule and and have added uh, UI our IIMC recovery techniques now as part of the training programs. That 135 operators are now required to do that as well. Um, even for VFR only operations. Um, so uh, I, know, I know the FAA continues to work with industry <clears throat> on coming up with the best uh, procedures for it. All right. And with well, that's, that's great response. Uh, we are approaching the top of the hour. We knew that we'd get lots of questions on this one today. So um, for those of you who have a hard stop at the top of the hour who are sending in, we understand if you need to step away, but for those 300 plus that are still with us, we welcome you to stay on board. We'll ask some more questions. All right, we'll keep moving on. So um, let's let's go ahead and uh, some. Let's see. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and shift to this one. Segrin Segmentson uh, ask a question about your career. What kind of professional background can lead to a career in accident investigation? Is being a pilot an example of a requirement? Uh, any one of you want to grab that one and go? Okay, so I'll, I'll start off here. Uh, as far as field investigators, it, it is required to be a be a pilot. You do have to have a commercial uh, instrument. Uh, there are there are pilot requirements. You don't have to be a helicopter pilot. Um, obviously, that's uh, that's icing on the cake if you do have it. Obviously, um, I mean, just a quick story how I got into it. As I mentioned before, parents were in the in the aviation business up here. I flew for them. I used to haul the NTSB around and uh, from accident site to accident site and uh, over the summertime here and got to know the guys when we sold our business ended up they contacted me and says hey you'd be pretty good at this and just on a whim put an application in and, and I was lucky enough to get it I, now I know how lucky I was because it's a pretty sought after job but kind of a different way of getting into it but uh, nevertheless it's been a great career yeah, yeah, I'll, appreciate that. I'll add from a OEM standpoint um, I started when I started as an investigator, I was just a newly minted private pilot. Um, but my background was engineering. Uh, I started at Sikorsky as a ground test engineer in mechanical test, doing qualification and acceptance tests for various components that eventually will go on a helicopter, hydraulic systems, fuel systems, transmissions. So I got a really good idea of how those systems work on the helicopter how they integrate together into the larger systems. And that was really a good foundation uh, with a mechanical engineering background to become an investigator. So, um, you know, there are other routes besides piloting to get into that as well. Uh, one of the folks that I worked with um, in my early days as an investigator at Sikorsky was uh, a former Marine crew chief. And so he had a more maintenance focused background and the third investigator at the time was a pilot. So we had a really good um, diversity of experience, engineering, maintenance, and piloting. 
All right. Well, great. Well, hey, uh, Skip, you know, a lot of the folks tuned in, as you as you may recall, there was 63% of the folks listening in have already been party to an investigation. So a lot of what you're sharing here today, they're going, yeah, I got it, been there, done that. So maybe there's something we can offer for them. Uh, we had a good question coming from Vincent Jansen, a blast from past for me, a Coast Guard officer who uh, spent quite a bit of time teaching accident investigation to fellow Coast Guard aviators. So he's got a, a question for you guys. Do you have any best practices to overcome hindsight bias in the accident investigation process? That's, that's a good one. I know I, I myself just, I look at every accident as the first accident I ever looked at. I try to go in without any blinders and just do the systematic approach to it by, you know, making and accounting for everything that's required for flight. I want to see there within the, the first few hours. If I don't see something, if I'm missing a tail rotor blade or a chunk of main rotor blade or, or something critical to the flight, then that's, you know, I want to make sure at accounting for that to make sure that it gets, you know, that we make, we find it and figure out what happened to it. So I think treating each one like it's your first time is, is my approach to it. I don't know what the other gentlemen do, but that's kind of the way that I try to keep my bias out of it. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I agree and I echo what uh, what Matt says. We have a certain process that we follow. We try to do everyone exactly the same as far as the on scene and, and all those procedures. Not every time can you do that, but that's that's what we strive to do. But I agree 100 percent. You can't bring bias from another another accident into the uh, into this accident, at least not at that juncture at the beginning part. You're there to gather the evidence. That's it. You're not in an, an analytical uh, portion or a portion of the investigation. That on-scene stuff should be just automatic as far as the, what, what, you're, what you're gathering, the way you gather that evidence and, and guard that evidence. Good, good sound advice. Thank you for that. And thank you for the question, Vince. Go Coast Guard. All right, so uh, moving on, we had a couple of questions come in from Eric Wallace Jr. and Carlos Schillinger. They both asked a question about pilot pressure. Do you all think we should do more as a community to reduce the pressure pilot face? And what might that look like? Well, I, I know uh, like NIMSPA, National EMS Pilot Association, they have an extensive program called their No Pressure Initiative. And um, that it's, if you can go to their website, I think it's nimspa.org or go through Ames or Hamoa or any of the other uh, association websites. Matter of fact, HA may have a link to it. I'm not sure, Chris. Um, but, you know, um, pressure is real. And I think whether it's self-induced or company-induced, you know, it can be deadly. And, you know, with SMS uh, on the forefront um, of, of pretty much everything, you know, uh, company pressure is one thing, but I honestly feel that from a pilot perspective, sometimes we're our own worst enemy and we create the pressure ourselves. So. No, absolutely concur. Good advice. Okay, uh, let's move on. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of get a little bit in your head there, Clint. So um, we've, uh, you know, you, you we recently did a uh, spotlight safety as a member of the safety working group, thank you. And you were talking about just this type of topic here, you know, key things to remember. And one of the things you brought up and you kind of touched on it in your presentation was human factors and how human factors, the broad scope of human factors apply in accidents. And uh, this, we saw firsthand evidence to this in a recent NTSB final report that cited the operator's safety culture as a key issue in the accident uh, chain and the influences. And they even laid uh, a little bit of uh, citation on the grounds of the FAA for failing to mandate SMS for certain commercial operations. So uh, have we entered a new era where we're placing more emphasis on full stream of human factors, including supervisory and organizational influences, and not just focusing on just the acts and the behaviors that lead to those unsafe acts? What do you think about that? Are we, we going yeah. there? Great question, and the short answer is yes, we're entering a different area here, but let me qualify that. 
So 24 years ago, when I started with the NTSB, um, a, a straightforward CFIT accident or in, inadvertent IMC with loss of control was pilot, the, the probable cause at that time, years ago, would read something like pilots uh, control, it, it, it continued flight into IMC conditions, loss of control in flight collision with train. That's where it would stay. Nowadays, we've learned over the years too. So in most cases, the, the, the regional investigators have a lot more resources available, whereas human factors investigators. Our human factors folks are much more involved nowadays in regional accident investigations than they were back then. And one of the reasons why is we're doing a much, much deeper dive now than we did 20 years ago. And we know that just peeling back that first uh, layer of the onion is not far enough. So we're doing a much, much deeper dive and each one of our regional investigators, if there's a reason, if there's a reason to bring in one of the specialists from Washington, D.C., that's uh, human factors investigators, we have that ability and our management supports us on that. So hopefully I addressed the question there, Chris. Oh, yeah, great answer. appreciate that. So thanks. Uh, let's go ahead and try one of these technical related ones. This is going back to you, Chris. Um, I think you might be a good one. Anybody else jump on? Uh, Christopher Ludwig. Of the aircraft, the accident aircraft investigated over your respective careers, how frequently is a crewed aircraft, as a as like the S61 in your case there, found to be operated in a manner outside the the, the rotorcraft flight manual versus the single pilot op operations? Is there have you noticed any distinct differences? You know, having that extra, you know, crew members or crew member on board. Well, I, I might have to recuse myself because all of the Sikorsky aircraft that I've yeah. investigated our, our multiple yeah. crew aircraft, um, at least in the operations that where I was investigating them. You know, we have some that are certified as single crew, but uh, I've never investigated a single crew accident. So I think I'll defer to uh, Clint and Matt on that one. Go ahead, Matt, if you want to take a stab at it. Um, sure. I mean, the, you know, it's <laughs> an. Unfortunately, most, the, uh, the majority of the aircraft helicopters flying out there today are part 27 single engine, single pilot um, aircraft out there. Um, but I think that sometimes we get maybe tunnel vision on what crew is. And I mean, part of SMS is everybody is part of the crew. Uh, from the mechanic to the janitor to the company president. And at any time, you know, if something, if somebody sees something wrong, uh, the culture that they establish in, in working as a crew um, could, could influence the safety of the, of the operation. Um, as far as uh, two pilots, um, the, a few of the two pilot accents i'm trying to think of a few that i've done um you know generally two heads are better than one but sometimes it just gets you get them there that much quicker to the accident site you know yeah. it, it depends on how how well they work together and and all that so so uh we're coming up i'm going to say we're probably going to have only about five minutes left to go i'm going to try to lightning around this so i'm going to ask only one of you to answer the next few que you know, a couple questions, and then we'll see if we can cover more ground that way. So we have Barry Holt ask this question. Do you feel that privacy issues have ever hindered an investigation? And, and I guess you could say, how did you overcome that hindrance? Want to try that, Clint? Privacy uh, issues, I guess I'm trying to trying to get a, a feel for. Yeah, I think that, you know, you know, the protection of information, you know, you know, maybe maybe getting having a hard time getting access to information due to privacy issues, that sort of thing. Let's just assume that's what they're referring to. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think where that comes into play is more into medical uh, HIPAA. You know, obviously, if you have a live pilot that you want to look at uh, medical records, that can be a little bit problematic, obviously. And, you know, but, but we have ways of working with uh, each one of those agencies to get that and, uh, you know, to, to zero down to what we need and then move on from there. We, we come across it every once in a while, but it's not something we see every single day by any stretch of that. All right. Well, uh, thanks for that. I got one for you, Matt. Um, I'm not going to give the name on this one just due to the question. As an investigator, 
within the regulator, when systemic failures are found within that regulatory system, I have found it frustrating to get in and change the, for the betterment of safety due to that bureaucratic, you know, the bureaucracy that's within that system. Um, looks like on that one we referred to earlier, you know, the FAA did, did make the final cut. So uh, any any other uh, recent accident investigations that you're aware of where that, that has been uh, overcome? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um... We are a, a, a bureaucratic agency. I mean, there's a total of, you know, 44,000 employees in the FAA and with the most of those being air traffic. So, you know, the FAA didn't get the nickname Tombstone Agency for nothing. Um, but part of it is the, it actually goes back to the original statement of the FAA for economic development and safety. And so just, changing a law or changing a rule is not an easy process. Everything has to be done through transparency, has to involve uh, the associated parties, and ultimately has to come down to what's it gonna cost the industry. And so it's a very, you know, there's two things that children should never see, so how to make sausage and, and how, they, how the FA makes rules. It's very, it's very time consuming, it's very, uh, can be ugly. Um, on the other part of it, I, I worked with one manufacturer just in the last few years that, uh, this was, it was a, it was a helicopter operator in this one, and they had never had this type of failure within their rotor system. It caused a fatal accident. Uh, they're on scene. Um, I actually didn't launch this one, but they, they sent me pictures and say, Hey, what do you think? And this, this is bad. And it was a fatigue failure of a particular component. And um, we the, worked with the NTSB, the NTSB said, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to it, you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll get it looked at in the lab and that type of thing. And, you know, I, I went on to, to my management and said, you know, this is something that we think needs to be looked at as quick as possible. Um, the, the wheels got in motion, NTSB looked at it and determined, oh gosh, it is a fatigue failure. And then seven days from that event, uh, we went out with a, an, an emergency AD and actually found uh, two aircraft uh, within that time frame for the inspection that had cracks in this component. So look at those saves. So we can move fast if 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 needed, but it is a frustrating process, and and, and I feel for you. Um, it, it's frustrating for us as well as safety professionals. All right. Well. For all the regulators and uh, government entities that are trying to do the right thing, sounds like Matt has a few words of advice. Can't guarantee you'll crack the code tonight, but we are making headway, so keep up the fight. Um, so uh, we're probably going to have time for one or two max here. I'm going to I'm trying to reach out to our international folks here. We have one from Luis Andres Preto Rojas. Is it possible to get information about accident investigations around the world, specifically in areas like Latin America. It is quite hard to obtain clear and updated data to understand and learn about helicopter accidents. I'll take on the first part of that one, and if any one of you want to pile on. So if you go to rotor.org slash safety, and uh, you can scroll down to the bottom, there is an area called Other Aviation Safety Reports. And in there, we... Uh, provide links that have been made available to us for various international uh, regional with Brazil, Canada, Europe, Japan, and the United States, and the list is going to grow. So we will work hard with the uh, our other entities around the world, the regional partners, to continue to populate this list and uh, expect this list to continue growing. Keep checking back, and then um, and then any anything else you'd like to add, particularly with you, uh, Clint? Uh, any 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 thoughts on that one? So each one of the regional offices are responsible for countries uh, overseas. So for the Alaska office, we cover Japan, South Korea, um, Canada, Russia, uh, Canada, Manitoba, West. So we have relationships with those folks. So whatever country it is, what I might suggest is see if you might be able to reach out to the regional office that's in, in charge of that um, that country and see if there's a way to, to maybe get a little bit more information out of them. But I, again, it, it's but we have relationships with countries that I just mentioned, but not the one that you mentioned there, Chris. All right. 
Okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's, you all did a great job of providing some key takeaways, but we want everybody to remember one. So just briefly, uh, if I could go around the horn, starting uh, with uh, you, Clint, in, in sequence that you presented, if everybody just remembered one thing, what would you like them to remember taking away from this event today? You know, basically, uh, I'm going to have to steal one of my investigators' uh, sayings, and he said, basically, if he was able to take uh, either a, a new pilot, a brand spanking new private pilot, or a, an old ATP pilot on an accident site once, it would change their way that they, they think about safety, and that there's some, some real benefit to that. So, that's it. All right. Great. Thanks. Matt? Yep. Um, I agree with Clint there. Uh, Checklist, checklist, checklist. Okay. And Chris? And, and I'll say hover power check, hover power check, hover power <laughs> check. But I'm going to add one. Thank you, Jay. The metal never lies. All right. Good one. Well, all right. So that wraps it up for today. We certainly have a lot of information packed into this one. Uh, certainly could have gone on much longer, but we want to respect your time. So I'm going to sign off now. I want to hand it back over to Dan. And uh, take it over, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Gentlemen, thank you so much. That information was invaluable. It was sobering. Um, I hope that people can understand that what the what horrific things you see on a regular basis and how you want to change that so that you don't see those things on a regular basis. So do appreciate your time. I invite you to go ahead and turn your cameras off. And we've got just a little bit of housekeeping work to finish up with for the day. We do have a follow-up questionnaire that will be coming to you shortly. We do ask that you take just a few minutes to fill it out. Uh, one of the questions we ask always is uh, what you'd like to see in a future webinar. Uh, th that information is very helpful to us. We want to make sure that we are providing topics that you find of interest. Save the date. Next week, we have our HAI at Work webinar on maintaining insurability in a challenging market. Uh, that will be uh, the same time as normal, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we do look forward to uh, sending you the invitation in uh, email, social media, and Rotor Daily. You should find that uh, fairly soon. As always, we close with let HAI know how you're, how we're doing. What can we do better? What can we do uh, that will better serve you? Um, if you like things that we are doing, please let us know that as well. Uh, you, the easiest way to do it is contact president at rotor.org through an email. Jim does receive every email and does assign it to uh, staff members for tasking. So we, uh, we will pay attention to those emails. We do appreciate your time today. Uh, we know that uh, there's always many things going on. Until next week, we ask that you fly safe, that you be safe, and we'll see you next week.